Thank you everyone, so like first of all I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the, uh, the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I'm Andy Moore, I'm a representative of the Australian Libertarian Society. So we're small government li libertarians, even no government libertarians, and uh, we don't believe in taxation, we don't believe in force, um, and ultimately we believe in free speech by consequence. So why do we believe in free speech? Why is free speech important? Free speech essentially is the right to turn your thoughts into words, to be able to use your body in the most ultimate sense of public life, which is speaking. Closer? Is that good? Cool, sweet. So, um, how absurd is that? So under this current government, we basically don't have the right in many circumstances to simply speak. Speak being the, the main way we interact with other people. It's an ultimate issue where we don't actually have control over our own body. We're not actually allowed to use it uh, as, we, um, as, we, as we wish. Um, and if we, used to, if we wish to use it in a way which is detestable to society, society in the abstract, or to the government, we suddenly come under the threat of legal sanction. We suddenly have the threats of the government and the threats of others ordering them to take money from us, to take our property. So you have a doubling down of infringements of individual rights. It's frankly disgusting. This is not the way that we organise a civil society. This is not the way that we organise our affairs. It's simply disgusting. And ultimately, if we don't have the right to say what we want, the right to communicate with others, then what rights do we have? If I can't say what I want or even express my thoughts freely, then why can I go out and buy the food that I want? Why can I go out and vote? In fact, we're even forced to vote. How great is that? Well, how am I even able to go out and choose who I want to live with? How many more rights are justified if I don't have the right to even speak? It's despicable. And, um, you know, ultimately we often talk about free speech and we talk about 18C, we talk about the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, and it's completely detestable, the idea that you should be fine for saying something which ultimately offends or infringes on someone else's, um, I guess, feelings in a sense. But there are many other free speech issues that we do not talk about. So free speech is ultimately a multifaceted issue. And this is why it's so important. When we talk about free speech, we're not just talking about things which are offensive to race, racial groups. Um, whose rights need to be defended, despite the disgusted, disgusting nature of the speech itself. We also end up talking about things like, as Sasha mentioned, defamation. We start talking about things like religious vilification laws. And we actually even start talking about some absurd interpretations of workplace bullying laws. So I guess what I want to do in my speech today is highlight some of these issues which aren't talked about by common free speech advocates, which I think are important. Because if we're just defending free speech, we're defending all rights of speech outside of violence. So something I want to touch on first off is defamation laws, and that's something that uh, Sacha picked up on very quickly. So Sydney has recently been labelled, and consistently labelled since 2002 in columns by legal and libel experts, the defamation capital of the world above London, which is insane. So technically under the law you have the right to go and sue someone if they make speech to at least one other person which lowers yourself or your, estimation, your reputation in the estimation of others. So if I, for example, put Paul Satya in front of another person and said, you're an idiot, you're cheating, you're cheating on your wife, you're a stealer and you're disgraceful, he could then say, well look, he now, that person now thinks lower of me, that person now sees a, low, sees a lower reputation of me and my property, my reputation, apparently property, is now damaged. And that has terrible, terrible consequences. Not just the idea that you can pretty much take anyone to court if they say something defamatory about you to someone else, but that it can be applied to so many things. And we especially see it in the case of the Me Too movement. We see with people who speak out against their uh, sexual aggressors and sexual abusers. When people, want to, when people want to go out and say to their friends, you know what, my, bo my boss is dodgy, my boss has been feeling me up, and I was sexually assaulted by him a couple of weeks ago. The first thing you will hear from the people in power is, I'm going to sue you, get your lawyers, get your defamation lawyers, and you will see me in court. And that is fucking disgraceful. We have lots of cases where people try to speak truth to power. People say, you know what, these abuses, these oppressions exist. And suddenly when they're, current, when they're put against someone who has the leap, has the lawyers, who has the money, they get taken to court. And it is disgraceful. And it's especially terrible because the people who are hurt the most are those who do not have the money to get a lawyer and those who have to settle outside of court. And even if you get proved of saying something which is true, which is an exception, an exception under defamation law, you still get you still get given the legal costs. You still get dragged from the courts. You still are, you still have all the court you still have all the costs associated with the process. And it drags you down in the process. And it is disgraceful. And that's only one that's only one example. There are many more to go through.
We have issues of whistleblowing laws in Australia. For example, if you work in uh, border protection units, under the Border Force Act, if you disclose information during your time, which is information of the border force and apparently only known to be known by, only, only to be known by the government, if you use that um, to tell someone else about perhaps the injustices of refugee detention or talk about refugee rights, using your position of power, then you are threatened immediately with two years imprisonment. So when people, for example, who are um, sharing government secrets to expose um, terrible things the government is doing in Minister Nauru, they're being threatened with two years of prison, and it's, it's disgraceful. And it's something that other countries generally don't do, unless you're looking at the US, where you see people like Edward Snowden or Chelsea Manning get dragged off the, dragged off the courts for saying things to help democracy. So we have refugee activists who have worked in the field and are trying to help our democracy make better informed decisions. They're getting dragged to the court to have their free speech infringed on. And another issue, funnily enough, and this is something you often don't hear the free speech might talk about, but I want to bring it up, is actually unions. Um, so we have some really, really weird workplace bullying laws in this country for the Fair Work Act. And we have um, we had a recent instance with, um, I don't know if you've heard of him, his name's Gabby the Rat. He's an inflatable rat that unions bring along to their protests. Um, and apparently the word scab, apparently it mean, it's, a, it's very hurtful words, you're not allowed to use it in the workplace. Um, so people don't use the word scab because they're going to get fined by the government, that speech is not okay, you're not allowed to say that. So what people do, what unions often do, is they bring along a big inflatable rat to protests to say, you know what, join a, join a, join a union, fight for better rights. That's their opinion, I don't agree with that, but that's what they want to say. But courts ordered unions, instead, to deflate their big inflatable rats, because apparently that posed a threat to people's feelings, made people feel like they were bad people. So we've actually got courts taking union, we've got, we've got um, businesses, businesses taking unions to, unions to court using inflatable rats. Another example um, is with the Eureka Stockade flag. So we now have, um, at the moment, um, through the Fair Work Commission, the government is asking unions, or telling unions, that they cannot actually wear Eureka, Eureka Stockade flags on their helmets or on any of their gear while they're working in public projects. So people are being told, and the, re the rationale for that is that if you wear a Eureka Stockade flag, you're being told you have to join a union to work, which is complete bullshit. This is another example of how free speech is being infringed on. And then there's also the last one I want to mention is religious, uh, religious and racial vilification act which is in Victoria. So if you criticise someone for their religion, then you suddenly get dragged to court as well, which is terrible. Because in a free society, we have the right to debate things like religion and its place, especially in a time when religious uh, rates are falling immensely. It's a topic of public speech, and as it was covered earlier, it's actually part, it's actually an implied right of political communication covered in the constitution. So to wrap up, there's a worrying trend which is happening with free speech and liberties in Australia and across the world. There's this worrying narrative, this worrying threat that no, no longer have rights. Everyone lives, everyone can say things they want to, but only if it's allowed. Speech is no longer a right, good speech is a right. You're allowed to say things that please others, you're allowed to say they're politically acceptable, but you're not allowed to say things which are possibly dubious or confronting, which is the most important speech. Rights are no longer inherent. Rights are no longer non-negotiable. They're given at the will of the government. We have to negotiate with governments for our own bodies, the control of our own lives. This is something which philosophers and political activists have fought in liberal countries for years and years and years. But the trend is dissipating. Exactly. We're falling, we are falling to the level of cattle and sheep. And the liberal tradition taught us that we are above animals, that we are seeking humans and we deserve rights. So on that note, I'd like to pass on to Meganus, where he is, wherever he is. And thank you. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.